Hi everyone, I'm back and this is the second half of my experience with my first experience with The Who. And um, I, this is Love, Rain or Me that I'm trying out, tasting, testing, exploring. My first listen is already completed a few days ago and now I have taken some time to listen some more, explore the music, um, see how it settles with me, and I want to tell you now where I am at this point. First, let me say a little bit about the, um, the history of the band, which I've learned by reading. This band was formed in London in 1964, and from what I've read in the past few days, they are considered one of the most influential rock bands of the 20th century. They've sold over 100 million records worldwide. And in 1990, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Their contributions are significant, and I found it interesting. Everything from the development of the Marshall Stack, and I was thinking, what is the Marshall Stack? Well, it turns out it's a particular stack of amplifiers which have become ubiquitous on stages around the world. You still find them pretty much anywhere you go for a big concert. <clears throat> All the way to the development of rock opera. Um, it seems their 1969 Tommy was the first album to be labeled as rock opera. Well, Love, Rain or Me is the last song of the Quadrophenia album, double album actually. And that was their sixth release in 1973 and the third rock opera signed by The Who. And since Quadrophenia is the only Who album entirely composed by, by Pete Townsend, I think it's fair to first hear what the composer has to say about it. And so this is one of the things that he said. Quadrophenia is music. It's angry music. It never lets up. It's full of energy. But it's also simply a story of a kid who has a bad day. It rains. He goes and sits on a rock. And he contemplates the future and the present. And he decides to do something that he's never done before. He prays. So at the end of the story, this is the last song on the double album. Jimmy steals a boat and takes it out to a rock out in the sea. And what happens out there is told in this song. Well, I haven't listened to the rest of the album yet. I'm sure I will at some point. So again, I'm coming at this kind of a little snapshot first impression without getting the whole picture yet. But somehow to me, this particular song doesn't strike me as being incredibly angry or never letting up. Maybe that's because I don't fully get it yet. But anyway, my impressions of it are a bit different than incredibly angry. I guess I'd describe it as more cathartic and cleansing. And I don't think I'm totally wrong either, because Pete Townsend also said at another time that rock music allows you to face up to your problems and then to dance all over them. I kind of like that idea. I found it really interesting that originally the composer envisioned this as being sung in a sort of whimper, a, a weak um, whisper voice. But when they went into the studio to produce it, the singer, Roger Daltrey, launched into it and gave it this passionate, visceral, frustrations let loose scream, which we hear on the, on the recording. And it was so compelling that they ended up keeping it that way. I think that was a fabulous choice. And, and it's, it's one of those moments that we musicians love because maybe a composer has a certain idea and we're always 
as interpreters and and um when we approach a piece of music which we didn't write ourselves somebody else wrote we're always interested to know what's their vision of it and can we realize that and and communicate it but then sometimes we come to it with a different idea and and the composer is like oh my goodness that's incredible and this was one of those moments from what i have found out and, and i love that about the music itself i know this is called rock music but this particular song has a lot in common with blues and gospel music including things like microtonal inflections in the vocal style of the melody being sung and generous use of various seven chords which you find in abundance in the chorus and I want to show you what I mean by seven chords for those of you who are not musicians. When we talk about a chord, we're talking about at least, at bare minimum, two notes, but really we're talking about a concept that includes at least three notes. So if I give an E flat minor chord, it could be this. You don't have to worry about the names of the notes. I'm just telling you this is E flat minor, and this is what it sounds like in its most elemental form and because this is the basic chord it has three notes and we tend to call it a triad because of that but then we can add notes to the chord without changing the chord itself we still have this but we're adding something to it I could add a seven and it has to do with how I'm counting up the notes it's nothing terribly complex it's just basically counting numbers one through, we don't even get up to 10, we just get up to eight. There's seven. And you see how it adds another layer of color in the sound, right? Well, I could do a different seven because that's not the only seven available to me. Ooh, that's a really complex sound and a little bit edgy. So we have these seven chords available to us, which are simply a chord with extra notes added. We can add other notes too. I could add a six, or I could add, well, we sometimes do go above 10. We could go up, let's say I could add a nine. That's interesting. So we do this with chords to add color and complexity and and tonal shadings in the music and that's what i mean when i say a seven chord so the verse doesn't actually have a lot of seven chords in it it's a different kind of chord and i'll get to that in a few minutes but the chorus is where we find all these fabulous stacks of seven chords one after the other these bluesy and gospel style influences are one of the big reasons that I was listening to it for the first time and said, I feel like I'm going south. Because that is where these styles of music originated. And while of course it spread all through the country and indeed all around the world, as evidenced by this song because this is a British band, it is still very much a part of the musical traditions in the south. And not only the musical traditions are where you hear it, you can hear it in the language too. The speech patterns and the cadences and accents that you hear in the American South. These are some of the things that lie at the roots of this music. And I don't think that this music could have developed, let's say, in California or Minnesota. It's just not uh, native to the language, the, the, the music of the language itself. So even if you're not very familiar with, with blues and gospel, or maybe you're not from the South, but you hear somebody speaking with a Southern accent, you might start noticing that there's this, there's this very bluesy, gospel-y style. Say a few sentences. Yeah, yeah, I have, to, I have to think of a few sentences. You know, 
I wasn't born in the South, but I've lived in the South for a good portion of my life. And, and when I find myself around the native speakers, I find my own speech reflecting these rhythms and styles as well. And I might go into a gas station to, you know, buy a bottle of water or, or something. And the cashier behind the counter might say, Hey, how you doing, hon? You know, and, and I buy my stuff and then bye, have a nice day. And, and you hear it in the language. And at first you might think it sounds sloppy or backwoodsy, but it's part of the melody of the language. And it's really beautiful in its own way. Well, I don't want to digress too much, but I want you to understand that that is something that shows up in these styles of music, which originated in the South. And when we talk about um, um, half tone and quarter tone inflections, some of it comes from the linguistic habits. I'll get to that in a minute. But first, let's talk about the form of the song. It's very standard. Verse, verse, chorus. Verse, chorus. Bridge, chorus. And the bridge section is very standard, um, tending towards a, a brighter, in this case, major, A flat major key, to contrast with the E flat minor tonality of the rest of the song. This form is such a classic, and it shows up in so many different song style genres, um, not only in blues and gospel, but, but, um, you can go back to classical music as well. Now I'm using classic in two, two different ways. I don't want to be confusing. And you find it in folk music. It's such a standard form. Why? Because it works so well. And if you were in a song composition class, it would be among the first handful of musical design structures that you would learn to use in your own compositions. Harmonically, the song is very standard too. They didn't try to go off the beaten track and break the norm with their chord choices. You don't always have to be inventing something new in order to do something incredibly good. And this is a wonderful example of that. In fact, speaking of chords, the entire verse part of the song rests on one single fundamental chord, and that is the E flat minor. Here again is our E flat minor chord. Now, the entire first, first verse, every verse, uses only this as the bass tonal uh, setup. Well, there are other notes added. Um, actually, it likes to use this a good deal. And then, well, if I put that up here, then I have the bass down here. And then to add a little bit of color shifting, it adds this, but it's still the same basic chord that we're working with all the way through the entire verse. You might imagine that creating a song with such a static foundation would end up being incredibly boring because we nearly always rely on harmonic changes to provide us a sense of travel, of going somewhere. I've talked about that in some of my earlier videos where I talked about the one chord and then we go somewhere to the five chord. We don't have that here. But it's great for us to notice and appreciate very simple elements achieving beautiful, even profound ends. And of course, this single chord as the ground on which the verse stands, is one of the things that makes it possible for the melody to be shaped in its improvisatory, free, bluesy, gospely style. Just a side note. I am kind of conflating blues and gospel right now, and I'm doing so intentionally. 
Many blues artists came from gospel singing church communities. Some of the greatest and most famous grew up singing in church or were influenced by their pastors singing or something like that. Even B.B. King got his start singing in church. So they're very closely intertwined. And while we, while we handle them differently and we track their development separately, blues and gospel are very much close relatives, very close. I want to show you some of the main characteristics of, of these gospel and blues styles. One of the things that we find very often is what's described as the blues scale. I've showed before in an earlier video the standard do re mi. That's the major major scale of western western art music. Um, the blues scale is different and just there are several options for it, but here's here's a standard one. Why do we have so many close notes right here? It's because in blues style singing, there is this element of, of notes that are kind of bent and, sh and warped a bit out of what we would consider standard pitch on the keyboard. Well, of course, it's a, it's a style that developed vocally. And the voice doesn't have individual keys to poke upon and say, this is this note, this is this note, and you have to get from here to here. The voice can slide every increment between. And so something that grew out of singing and speaking has these inflections built in. And I don't want to, again, I don't want to digress too far and go too deep into the history of this because I understand this is simply one of the big influences in rock music, in this particular piece of rock music especially. But going back to the accent, have a nice day. You hear this lilt and this, it's not just have a nice day, precise, cut, um, straight, have a nice day. And, and the voice rises, the, the vowels are changed somewhat. And for somebody who doesn't, who isn't, um, familiar with identifying those different styles, that's one of the easiest ways to relate. This is have a nice day. You know, this could be have a nice day. Something like that, right? So, the blue scale and and these inflections that we have are one of the ways that this music uses to create very very rich expressive a very rich expressive impact on the listener and to communicate some very deep um feelings so my point for bringing that out is because the blues and gospel styles are so closely related, often being described as two sides of the same coin, a song like this always feels to me like it has some spiritual overtones. And I think it's perfectly appropriate, especially considering the story behind this particular song. But the other thing that I want to mention that I think is great about the song is the rain, the thunderstorm element. It's wonderful. And I guess that is the other reason that it makes me feel like I'm going south. Well, as I said, I've spent a lot of my life in the south, in Tennessee especially. And in Tennessee, we get these wonderful, dramatic, drenching thunderstorms in the summer. It's something that I associate with the southern climate, which is found not only in Tennessee, but of course, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, and so on. You, in the summer especially, you get these sultry, humid, heavy air days, and you almost feel like you're breathing underwater sometimes. <laughs> um, Vlad is not from Tennessee. 
And and his his first experience with the Tennessee summer weather has been very recent. And he says he walks out the door and he feels like he can't breathe. And I tell him this joke that we have. If you don't like it, wait a minute. It's kind of true because it gets to the point where you think it's impossible to take it anymore. And then suddenly the clouds pile up, the thunder comes crashing, and the rain comes down in bucket loads. And you can feel that in this song, especially the way they use the strings and piano to create these textures. And, of course, after the rain comes pouring down, the clouds clear away, and you suddenly have this clear chance to breathe for a moment. And so that is something which I think this song portrays in its music very well. And, and I love it. So these two things, the bluesy gospel style influences and this stormy, drenching water evoking in the music are what makes me feel like this is music that takes me to the American South. And I find that so interesting because, again, this piece of music was created by a British band. I don't know if they ever experienced that sort of thing, but by using those elements, it fits perfectly. Now, these layers of references, allusions, wordplay, evocative instrumental accompaniment, they all work together and end up creating this wonderful catharsis, which is both sensual and spiritual. You can hear in this song hope, pain, surrender, release. Switch the words up just a little bit and you could sing this in a gospel church. Don't destroy me for saying that, I, because I seriously mean no disrespect to church music. But in a way, this song fulfills the goal of a good church song without the religion. I guess we could say that's why gospel and blues both get called soul music. I also love the similes and metaphors in the lyrics. From the sensual, earthy sweat of lovers laying in the fields, to the spiritual yearning for the sky, the rain drenches it all. And is it rain? Or is it rain? Are we anointed, baptized, even crowned by the torrential downpour, healed by its onslaught? Or are we surrendering to a higher power, finding redemption in a world where we are not at the center? And in this song, we find both to be true. And then we're thrown back to feel the thirst and craving desperation of the dry and dusty road and the sleepless nights and the, the fundamental human needs. It's not only these words and lines, but every verse sends the listener multiple places at once. So depending on what your needs are in the moment, your experience, you are quite likely to find something standing out that is relevant to you in that moment. Overall, I would say that this is an example of really excellent use of a compositional design which really has nothing out of the ordinary, but the artistic handling of it creates a wonderfully evocative musical experience, which also has a lot of depth to explore. It's the type of song which a person can take with them through years and experiences and growings and reshapings of life. And the music will continue to have something meaningful to offer. Likely different things at different times, but it doesn't wear out quickly. This incredibly competent, artful, masterful hand handling of a form and making it work to create this experience is very much the same sort of thing that you see 
classical composers doing. Not only classical, you find it in any genre, but, um, but somebody who has that artistic mastery gift, if you want to call it that, is able to take something which somebody else could turn into, okay, yeah, it works. I could have a student write something in this form and it would come out tolerable, acceptable, nothing outstanding. And then you hand it to somebody who's brilliant and a master and they, they come up with this, this creation that is just incredibly impactful. It's the same thing you find in, say, symphonies or concertos or sonatas or, or other things. There have been hundreds and thousands of those written, which we won't be sorry if we never hear them again. But there are those which continue to have this meaningful relevance in our lives, this impact on us personally and societally, that some music by some artists, some composers, is able to still speak tens and twenties and hundreds of years on. And in that way, I think that this particular song does the same thing. It's not likely to get terribly irrelevant. Maybe the style will become outdated. Maybe at some point somebody will say, oh, that's old music, um, you know, we're, we're into something different now. Fine. But it's still going to be something that speaks and, and serves anybody who takes the time to listen to it. Do I like it? I enjoyed it. I've never been one to put on a playlist of blues or gospel music or rock music, but I enjoy a little moment of this style from time to time. And I feel the same way about this song. Now, don't forget about the poll, which is still in the community tab. Go there and vote for your favorite band because I will review the winning song next month. Also, remember that we publish both parts of my first experiences with a song, in this case, this song, at the same time here on YouTube, both my first listen and my in-depth analysis. Now, if you want early access to the first listen, all you have to do is visit my coffee page, make a donation of your choice, and that will give you early access to all my first listen reaction videos. If you want to receive notifications when I post new content, you can activate it by clicking the little bell button next to the subscribe button and click this link to watch the first half of this experience where I do my first listen and reaction to this song. I'll see you soon.